When I started, I was intent on making sure that good food went to feed people. I didn't realize that actually I was starting both a social and an environmental organization. Welcome to the second renaissance where we decode the rebirth of human creativity in a technology-driven world. In this second season, we explore how sustainability is elevating our human consciousness and catalyzing us to create within constraints. We decipher why now is the biggest entrepreneurial opportunity since the dawn of industrialization and what leaders can do to harness these winds of change. I'm Anders Sorman Nilsson, global futurist, impact champion and father and your host for The Second Renaissance. In today's episode of The Second Renaissance, I sit down for a conversation with Ronnie Kahn, the founder of Oz Harvest, to decode the issue of food waste, food rescue, and the environmental impacts of the current international food system, and what we can do to innovate ourselves out of this social and environmental injustice. We also talk about Ronnie's spiritual journey, yoga and meditation at Bondi Beach, and what she learned about creating social impact in Soweto, South Africa. Ronnie Khan is not only the author of this fantastic book, A Repurposed Life, but she's also a social entrepreneur and founder and CEO of food rescue charity Oz Harvest. Ronnie is a passionate advocate and activist renowned for disrupting the food waste landscape in Australia and beyond. She appears regularly in national media, serves in an advisory capacity to government, and is a sought-after keynote speaker. Her mission to fight food waste and feed hungry people is supported by some of the world's finest chefs. She's an officer of the Order of Australia, AO, and was named Australian Local Hero of the Year. Her journey is the subject of a feature film, Food Fighter, and her memoir, A Repurposed Life, has recently been published. Ronnie describes herself as an accidental activist, but I think as you'll find in today's story, there is something very intentional and purposeful about her journey. I left this conversation feeling like Ronnie had reached into my heart and soul, and I think you will find that she has a similar effect on you. Ronnie Khan, welcome to the Second Renaissance. Thank you so much. What a what a treat to be chatting with you. It is. Uh, it's been a long time in the making. I was just uh, we were just having a little bit of a preamble here, uh, going back many moons ago to the fabulous Bondi Beach and sitting and doing yoga and meditation sessions. And uh, I think they were they in the early happen. days. Those still happen, and it's very precious and beautiful. Yeah, fantastic. I know it's something that's close to your heart and my heart as well. I have a sense that since Oz Harvest, which we were going to talk about here today, since you started it up around 2004, there's been this sort of, I feel like a a bit of a collective awakening going on around the world, whether it's around food waste, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the rise of the conscious consumer, conscious capitalism. What's your sense? What's different in 2022 compared to you know 15 or so years ago since we since we first met in Bondi? Yeah. Well, I definitely think there has been a slow awakening. If I recall, in 2003, 2004, my personal spiritual awakening happened, and my personal connection to doing something greater than myself happened. But quite honestly, the reason I think that Oz Harvest is so successful is that in 2004, I was a lone voice about food waste. Nobody was talking about it. And the truth is, I didn't even realize the significance. Really, when I started, I was intent on making sure that good food went to feed people. I didn't realize that actually I was starting both a social and an environmental organization. It took a while for me to understand the size of the problem. I thought I was just dealing with my own little problem that came out of the event industry because that's where I saw food waste because I was creating it. And really part of the success is the the logic around the fact that other people's mothers, grandmothers, aunts and uncles had turned around to them and said, eat your food because there's someone starving somewhere. And in fact, I recall going to talk to a CEO of a major corporation. When I walked into his room, his office, 
His feet were up on the desk. His arms were folded and said, why would my people be interested in anything that you have to offer or say? Because I was going to pitch for money and to partner with this organization in the early days. And I looked him in the eye and said, tell me, did your mother ever tell you to eat your food because someone was hungry somewhere? His feet came down off the desk. He stamped his hand and said, every day my mother told me to eat my food. I said, well, you've got 15,000 staff and their mothers told them to. And that's the reason to partner with us, which he did. But it was, it was that message and tapping into that known collective that I think helped us significantly. But it's very different today. Yeah, and, and there's not necessarily a, a statement or a pitch you can put in a in a PowerPoint deck. So I'm I'm glad you held him to account. There's always a story about the, a mother and 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 the implications of of our parenting when it comes to comes to your story. I mean, I had it this morning with my five year old Lucian. I'd made him some uh, scrambled eggs this morning because he didn't have much of his dinner last night. And I actually told him I'm going to sit down with this fantastic woman, this inspiration who fixes is fixing the food waste and, and food uh, security problem uh, on a local, national, even global level now. So I have a few new stories for, for, for Lucian as well. And um, did he eat up all his scrambled eggs? He did about three, quarter, about three quarters of them. And, um, and it left me wondering, I mean, certainly, you know, the food that we waste, we, we, we compost and we're very diligent composters. So that's the environmental bit that we might talk about in a moment. To, to ensure that we're actually sequestering and, and turning food into, into something else. Um, but you said that you sort of meet at these concentric circles of, you know, food rescue and, 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 and food safety, um, food risk redistribution, but there's also the environmental issue here. Can you just elaborate on, on that a little bit for, for our listeners and our viewers? Absolutely. And before I do, I, I don't have it on this desk because I was not prepared but has your boy got Lenny and the Kangaroo? Lenny and the Ants, sorry, the book that we wrote for young kids about not wasting food. Fantastic. I'm going to add it to my list now. Absolutely, because it really is this issue. So I think what happened was as I started realizing that this was a Today, we know that it's a $36.6 billion issue. But early on, I started realizing that, well, it wasn't just the event industry. I walked into my local greengrocer and said, do you ever have any waste? And he said, yeah, I got the milk, I got the bread, I've got this. I said, well, what if I could collect it and deliver it to someone in need? He said, come on, be my guest. That would be a blessing for me. So the point is, it, it started snowballing because I realized the scale of the problem. And once I realized the scale of the problem and started delving into it and understanding that food waste feeds climate change. Now, today we know this. The science has proven it. The beautiful book Project Drawdown, if anyone hasn't read it, needs to look at it because there he iterates how if food waste were a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of methane gas after the US and China. And methane gas is 20 times more powerful and more damaging than carbon dioxide. And what happens is when food waste goes into landfill, it gives off methane. And so the more we can stop food from going to landfill, the better for the planet but I didn't know that right in the very beginning, but it slowly dawned. And that's when we started launching education programs. And that's what most people know us just for our food rescue. You see our yellow vans around the country. And yes, we are global. And that was, you know, it was never my intention to create a global organization. But the point is, there is so much awareness now. And in 2015, I went to Parliament House and we got our country, as in Labour, the Libs and Greens, the then Environment Minister, Greg Hunt, to commit to halving food waste by 2030. It was only the next year that the UNSDG goals came out. 
but um, we are committed now and there's only seven and a half years left. And unless we, all of those who are listening, citizens, start taking action because, you know, and there's so many, we all would love to be climate activists now. We just don't know how. And not all of us can afford an electric vehicle because we think, oh, if I have an electric vehicle, I'm doing good. And not all of us can put solar on our roofs because we think if we could do that, then we're really helping. But what we don't realize is we start valuing food and every one of us becomes a food waste hero in their own homes. Two things are going to happen. They're going to save money. And I can talk to that but they're also going to save our planet because our citizens, consumers, we don't know and realize that we are responsible for 60% of waste comes from households. Yeah. And I mean, in Australia, I think the statistics are something that one in three shopping bags that make it into the home ends up in, in landfill. One in five. One in five. Okay. Have yeah, we that's improved? That's what the research shows. No, but that's what the research shows. And the research also shows that we would save every household between $1,500 and $3,000 a year. And given the cost of living right now, given that we are in inflation times, potential recession, Every dollar counts, but it's more understanding the value of food, what it costs to grow, labor, love, energy, fuel goes into every apple, every lettuce that we throw away. Yeah. I, I just want to reflect for a moment. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been reading your, your fantastic book, uh, call, me, call Me Late to the Party here as, as a futurist. I know it was released a couple of years ago, but what really resonates, I mean, not just your story of, of growing up in apartheid South Africa and spending time in, in Israel on a kibbutz and, and all your lessons from, from, from that world. We can just give a, a repurposed life a, a really big plug here and a big thumbs up. Um, I'm going to get the junior version for Lucian as well. Um, but what, what sort of strikes me here is, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm proponent of the idea of the circular economy, which you could probably plug into the UN Sustainable Development Goal number 12 um, in terms of responsible consumption and also, of course, production. Um, but a repurposed life to me strikes like a at least as a reader, might have some sort of dual or even several layers of meaning. Because for me, I, I saw that you repurposed your life, but you're also repurposing, uh, which is part of the circular economy, the fact that we that we already have life, we give life through food, we give energy through food, Absolutely. and something that's already existing is being repurposed to give life yeah. to, to others. Um, yeah. At least that's how I read it. Do you want to just expand on the title? Because sure. I think it's so spot on. Thank you so much. You know, it's so interesting because the book came out j just as COVID hit. Now, of course, it had been written, it had taken myself and Jesse, my daughter-in-law who co-wrote the book with me, um, the best part of the two years previous to COVID. But in fact, it turns out from what readers tell me, not from what I intended. I intended the book which was written as a memoir, really to be not a lesson, but to share the possibilities of learning. And people through COVID have told me and, and since that it absolutely is a toolkit, is a book that has literally all of those elements of, yeah, sharing but by sharing my story giving people the opportunity to rethink and reevaluate their own lives and i i didn't you know when i set out to write the book people asked me why did i write it and i think i had never intended to write a book but i think i wrote it at the time because i mentor a lot of people and i knew that if it was helpful to those people. Perhaps my book would be this bigger version of something that people could glean some some lesson out of. And you know, the other day I was just walking down the street and a guy pulled up and he ran and he said, 
I just need to tell you that your book has changed my life. I just want to thank you for the better. Bye. And he jumped back in his car. And, you know, I didn't even have time to say, well, why? But but obviously something resonated. So, yeah, it has that ability. It is all about the circular circular life. I mean, within it, my life changed significantly once I started as Harvest and found purpose and meaning. And I think that particularly post-COVID, from whether you're a corporate listening to this or whether you're an individual, this notion of purpose is so huge and we all wish we could walk into the supermarket, find it on shelf three in aisle two, buy some drink it and then go There off. you got your purpose, yes. Yeah, but in fact, you've got it. You just have to look in the mirror. <laughs> there's, a, there's a saying out of the um, Okinawan archipelago uh, called Ikigai, which has sort of been you know, trend, trend. Yeah, it's been trending in the World Economic Forum, etc. And I think, you know, it's been part of many brands sort of, you know, rediscovery of their, you know, their big why. Um, and, you know, it's this wonderful concept, and you're across it already, this, you know, the concentric circles of doing something you're good at, something uh, that you are passionate about, that can make you a little bit of money, but it's also good, good for the world. It sounds like you sort of reached that eureka moment or that life's purpose. But what, like, was there just like one aha moment or was there several factors that you feel sort of, you know, converged into you having this, this yeah. realization of, of how, how you could repurpose your life? Look, there's no doubt that I've been throwing away thousands of kilos of food because that's what the industry that I was in did. You finished an event very late. I always wanted to make sure that there was plenty food because I never wanted somebody to leave my events hungry. I did do an event that was huge, huge investment in food. And my guests got pissed as they walked in and nobody touched the food. That quantity of food sitting there, it just was unconscionable to throw it away. And so I actually literally, that was the first time my rogue food rescue life began because I literally just loaded up a van and took it to the one place that I knew. And it was received with such grace and joy that I couldn't wait for the next event because I knew there'd be food left over and I did it again and then again and then again. But I still was not, you know, this was just fun. And not only fun, it felt really good. But of course, between doing that and continuing to run my business you know it was like a side hustle <laughs> and an add-on to the business until I'm thinking really deeply about what I was doing and I thought I'd go back to South Africa for a visit and I talk about this in the book and I did have a light bulb moment and that light bulb moment was when I visited my girlfriend in South Africa who was much older than me in fact today she is 95 and she's still going and extraordinary she's just actually traveled to america and back from south africa so an extraordinary dynamo and a mentor without even knowing and i went back to south africa and she said we're going to go and visit soweto now soweto in my childhood was a very scary place it was dusty and smoky and crime ridden and white people, bear in mind that I grew up under the apartheid era where white and black were very delineated. And it was mandated that black people were not equal and not the same as white people. And Soweto was this den of iniquity to me growing up, scary as not a place I'd go to. But now we're talking 30 years later, Mandela's been released, it's the new South Africa, I have not been back. And I think I'll just go back for a week. And Selma says, great, come and see me. And we're going to go to Soweto to visit an AIDS clinic that I've set up. Now, I didn't know what she'd done. I'd left South Africa because I didn't believe I could make a difference there. One person, how can one person make a difference? I now know that very, very, very differently now. And as we drive into Soweto, Selma tells me that she was responsible for electricity in this 
what was then a township is now a city of three million people. And honestly, the hairs on my arms stood up because all I could imagine was what would it feel like to know that you've made that kind of difference to that many people. And by the time I'd got to the AIDS clinic, I knew that actually I'd set up an organization to formally rescue food and deliver it to people in need. I had no idea how I'd do that. I'd never done it before. It wasn't my childhood dream. I'd never intended to start a charity. And in fact, I worked full time for the next seven years. But that that was my light bulb moment. And I believe every single one of us at some point has a time when we say, okay, I have got, something has got a shift. And we need to recognize that and honor it. And it doesn't have to be, as I say, I didn't give up my work. I, you know, I've had a thousand people come to me and say, one day I'll do something and one day I'll start a charity. So first of all, there is no one day. And secondly, there is no, no one day. All we have is now. You know, you think of Shane Warne. Do you think that he woke up on that day at the age of 53 thinking, this is my last day. I'm going to be amazing today because today is my last. We don't know. So all we have is now. And I worked for the first seven years running my business because I couldn't afford. It didn't occur to me. I wasn't intending to make money out of our harvest. So we, and, and not everybody has to start a charity. We can be amazing and find purpose in just being the best that we are meant to be. Mm. There's, um, I mean, it just strikes me as, as, as you're retelling this and sharing this, this story, there's a philosopher called Peter Singer, who I'm sure you come across and, and there's a whole movement around some of his thoughts and around effective altruism and, and he, he seems to be of the opinion that, um, and the effective altruism movement is, you know, making a difference where you're sort of, you know, it's, it's taking very much a sort of an investment approach to, to, to altruism and, and, and ensuring that you get the most sort of return on the investment of every dollar. And, and another sort of related concept here is that, you know, some people might actually make the most difference by being an investment banker, but then giving money to, to, to charities, for example. It's not that everyone has to become a volunteer or, although we encourage that, um, or have to go and, you know, uh, on voluntourism uh, holidays, for example. That's But that's some people making money and then, you know, reinvesting yeah. it. Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because it's, it's, it's a do. bit of a controversial topic. Yeah, you know, I heard Dan Pelota. I don't know if you recall or know anything about Dan Pelota. I heard a talk maybe 10 years ago. So this was an investment banker who was earning a fortune. In fact, I think he created... He created either one of the biggest runs. I can't actually recall now or if it's Movember. One of those amazing things. And he thought, wow, I just love this. I'm earning a shitload, but I don't care about the money. I've got enough now. Let me go and work in a charity. And when he went and, and you know, was offered the role and was, whether it was offered, you know, a tenth of his salary, he thought this is crazy. First of all, People should be paid what they're worth in our industry because you want to get the best people. But he said, it is more valuable for me to work as a banker and then invest my money and give it to these organizations who we should trust to use that money well. He also talks about this notion of, you know, when people give you money and then want thousands of reports and then tell you how you should use the money. It's like, you know, you have to trust the organizations that you want to invest in, that they know how to use that money well. And so the minute people want to have tied funding and, you know, it's all very well have your name attached to it, but it's really important to trust and believe that the people running the organization know how to use it best. Of course, if you've got a particular passion and want it to be used for that, but it's that over-management of the philanthropic investment that causes so many challenges to charitable organizations because then we start having to address their needs and not the needs of that we are addressing. 
Mm. There's um there's a wonderful sense of creativity in everything that you do. And I, I think of the UN Sustainable Development Goals almost like these constraints that catalyze creativity. And, and certainly you were well before uh, the, the United Nations and the 193 nations signed up to this initiative. But I tend to think of them as as innovation catalysts. You know, you can build business models clearly around, you know, like uh, who gives a crap does around goal number six of, of you know, clean water and um, hygiene and sanitation, for example. And, you know, they're giving away 50 percent of profits to, towards initiatives like that. So you can build business models around this. I'm curious you know, you guys do more with less, you know, there's existing resources, they get redistributed. And at the same time, we're also helping to to, to limit, you know, carbon emissions, etc. So I'm, I'm curious, how do you think of creativity within constraints? Um, and this idea that maybe even technologies today help us be more productive while treading uh, more lightly on the planet at the same time? Innovation is part of our DNA. I mean, just starting Oz Harvest was an innovation in its own right because nobody was touching surplus food. And then every one of our programs, you know, our four pillars, rescue, educate, innovate, engage. I'm sure you probably don't know that we have an innovation arm. Um, it's currently called the Four Purpose Co, set up as a separate business, a four purpose social business. We're about to change its name to Oz Harvest Ventures because that feels more appropriate. Yeah, but it really exactly. is about looking at how we can use agri-tech technology, all the new forms that are around us to solve big problems and particularly the problem that we're facing, which is all about waste. So interestingly, you know, we've been doing research as part of our innovation and we have we we did world first research on what it's going to take to shift consumer behavior because it's really hard to shift behavior we're we're consumptive we love convenience and that's part of the reason for waste it's easy to run into a supermarket all hours of the day buy what we think we need and then let it go to waste so just to give you an idea of how much we believe in technology or how much we believe in research and how much we believe in shifting and changing the dial, this is one of our products. This actually isn't about, uh, this isn't from our venture business. This is from within Oz Harvest Research. And so this is a use it up type. Yeah, and I'll tell you what it is because we threw, together with University of Monash University, we did research to understand what is the most likely behavior that we as consumers, citizens, will take to half food waste. And the research based on a huge demographic study was that we would be willing to use it up. So in order to make it front of mind and to make it um, easy, we created this tape which says, cook me, pick me up, you know, don't waste me, eat me, um, which you tear off and put on a shelf in your fridge. And it's it's been designed as special paper with vegetable ink. And again, all of these are world first. Um, as a visual reminder to take whatever's in your fridge that needs using up and to put it on the shelf and to use it up first. The half-eaten yogurt before you go and take put it at the back of the fridge and a new one comes out. And the research also shows that families are very much engaged in this and by making a shopping list, the family's getting engaged and teenagers are getting engaged and the households using this are saving, are show, the research is showing that they've saved about 30% of their food waste. This yeah. product is free on the Oz Harvest website. So, Fantastic. My yeah. son Lucian loves uh, what he calls stippy tape. Yes, exactly. <laughs> stippy, stippy tape. So he, he yeah, will, my five-year-old, my five-year-old sticks it onto the apples in the and on things in the pantry. It's beautiful, but he's engaged, yeah. and then you can have a conversation about it. And um, and I, I love I love the initiative because it goes all the way through to our very human psyche from you know from childhood. It's gamifying. Up to, 
Uh, yeah, it's gamifying and it, you know, and behavioral economists like Richard Thaler exactly. and and the and, and the people behind the nudge movement would exactly. uh, w- would give you full f- full ticks here as well. Yeah, but um, I'm totally looking at you know. I look at thank you water. I look at what the crap. I look at all those, and we are designing and working within those harvest ventures on where we can disrupt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and what we can do, and so yeah, innovation is hugely important tech used it used appropriately we we rolled out it and i always for one of our just our delivery services and it's always it with heart it's never mm-hmm. just about it you've got to have the people behind it and the people connection now we're nearly into the to, to the time zone here uh end zone i should say and, and the final final innings here ronnie um to to get a little bit of anglo here um I'm I'm an immigrant to to Australia. You're an immigrant to Australia. Um, I have two young kids at home. We've got Aurelian, who's ten months of age. Lucian is five. Um, me 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 and my wife were both we're both entrepreneurs. Um, it strikes me when reading your book that you know you came to Australia as an immigrant, South African origins. You spent time on a kibbutz in in, in Israel. You came here. I understand that there was a separation from your then then partner, and you've created all of this um, as a you know at the time. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. S- single mum, very busy entrepreneur. I mean, I struggle um, to get more than 20, 30 hours of work in per week uh, with all of my very you know Swedish sort of paternal yeah. uh, responsibilities <laughs> and, and and all the rest. I mean, what what advice do you have for parents? Um, for immigrants coming to to a new country, including Australia, to to really live their life's purpose and 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 do something with the time that we have available to us. So I I firmly believe that first of all, coming to Australia was really coming to the promised land. <laughs> I think we are particularly fortunate living in this extraordinary country that has huge opportunity for those that are willing to work hard and give back. So. For me, you know, when I ran my business, I was passionate about running my business. I needed I needed to provide food and a roof over my head and food on the table for my kids. And that's what inspired me. I do I do know that I seem to have absorbed from my family and my parents an enormous amount of energy. So I am I am privileged in that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm capable of doing a lot, it would seem. I went out on a van with one of my drivers last week and it was just a wonderful experience. And by the end of it, because I'd stopped everywhere and was speaking to everyone and inviting them to get on vans and, you know, doing inspiring, intent, not intending to, but getting people engaged. And at the end, my driver was exhausted and I said, well, I'm still going to an event tonight. And he just kind of said, oh, I think I was doing a gig or I was doing this. And he just said, so how do you do this? But I'm so privileged. I'm so lucky. I love what I do. And so I think um, it is it is incumbent on us, particularly as a new immigrant, to see how we can be the most, the most grateful. And I think gratitude is a huge thing we haven't touched on because I think gratitude is the fuel and the fire that inspires me and allows me, you know, walking along. I'm very privileged. I live very close to the beach and I walked along the beach this morning. And honestly, all I can think is I'm so grateful that I've got eyes to see the ocean, ears to hear the waves and the legs to walk, you know, and never take for granted and that I'm in a country that I'm free as a woman to be able to do whatever it is. So I think it is incumbent on each and every one of us to be the best we can be, not whether you're an immigrant or not, but as an immigrant, I'm very mindful that I was able to make a choice and live that choice and therefore I, there is a bigger responsibility. And it's interesting. That is also why I, I, I was so intent on starting South Africa Harvest because that's where I got my education. And I, 
and the need there is so huge. So South Africa harvest for me is such a is a big deal because it's now doing magnificent work and it's having shared our model actually with my childhood friend and sweetheart and love beautiful brother who now runs South Africa Harvest. Yeah, and a really nice, I think, I mean, there's a saying, which I always thought it was a little bit um, defeatist, but uh, there's a saying that you never become a prophet in your hometown, but maybe maybe you're actually proving proving that saying wrong. And it's, an, it's a very nice sort of, you know, in the, I guess in the spirit of circularity, it's a really nice heartening story of you coming back and, and, and making a real difference. Yeah, but, you know, everything about us harvest, everything about South Africa harvest or Kiwi harvest or UK harvest or Japan is really about our model. It's about what we've created. I happen to be the vessel that was so so blessed, fortunate, privileged to start it and to create this movement. But yeah, I'm not, ex I'm not a prophet. I think really beautiful parting words and um, no, no doubt your, your legacy and the, the, the scaling of your own humanity will, will certainly come through other vessels and other, other humans that you've inspired <laughs> and, and, and touched uh, through, through this amazing you know social social venture ronnie it's been it's been a privilege and and really an honor to to reconnect and 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 to have you on the second renaissance and inspiring creativity thank you so much for touching on circularity inspiration all of our roles and what we are here to do on this planet and to protect our planet and it's been a pleasure chatting with you and it's lovely to reconnect Thank you. And finally, beyond keeping an eye out for the beautiful yellow and black vans and the wonderful Sons of Ray that you display with your own yellow brand, yellow black brand, what, what can we do to support your movement? Phenomenal. So first of all, even just by purchasing the book, we can enable more meals to be delivered. But we need time, food and money. So time is your skills, your volunteering, your ability to share what you do, what you know, or your or our message with others. Food, if you know food businesses, if you know people who are engaged in the manufacturing, farmers, please share with them that their good produce does not have to go to waste because we know that a third of all food goes to waste. We want to make sure that we repurpose that food. And if you've got money, every dollar allows us to deliver at least two meals to someone in need here or wherever. And so generosity of spirit, time and means are the most valuable for us. Yeah, fantastic. So the message is to, to repurpose life, repurpose energy and um and uh, make sure that you also uh, tune into OzHarvest.org, I believe is the yeah. website. Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. Absolutely. Fantastic. Ronnie, again, Sababa, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. No worries. Thank you. One person can make a difference. It starts with you and you can amplify your humanity and empathy through people, technology and innovation. This is what I took away from today's conversation with Ronnie. How about you? Drop me a line on anders at think.com and let me know. And don't forget to answer Ronnie's important call to action. Next on The Second Renaissance, I sit down in the Think studio with Mike Hanley, the former head of digital communications at the World Economic Forum, to look at how content and digital nutrition can help change the world and create signal in the noise. For more information about the Second Renaissance and our work on sustainable innovation, please visit my website, www.andersumanilson.com. We would appreciate if you can take a moment to share the podcast with a friend or a colleague and help build the movement. We hope that what we learn together on the Second Renaissance can help us all build a sustainable future for ourselves and our children. See you in the near future.